Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure um, to uh, see so many of you here uh, today. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, let me say a few words of uh, why we are here uh, today or in what context uh, a lot of this is happening. Um, so about a year ago, um, I came back from uh, Redmond after having been on a leave of absence there for two years. Um, initially, I was just gonna, going to come back to ETH. Um, the, um, so I, by the way, I'm uh, Mark Polofez and I'm uh, leading the mixed reality and AI lab here in Zurich um, for Microsoft. I'm also a professor uh, at ETH Zurich. Um, so about a year ago, came back. We also had, I think, exa almost exactly a year ago, uh, we're sitting here with, with Satya and discussed uh, this new lab that we were building up. Um, and uh, so about a year later, we've, uh, we're now at a stage where we actually build a lab. We moved into our new spaces. Um, and so uh, it's great pleasure to have Alex Kipman here in that context. Uh, he will tell us um, everything, all the secrets about HoloLens 2. Uh, maybe. Um, and um, uh, so let, let me say a few more words about our lab, what we are focused on. Um, so the lab is really trying to blend the, to bring together both very interesting, challenging research problems that we have in industry, trying to make, as you'll see, an, an amazing product, super complicated product with innovation in many, many different areas, to realize our vision, which goes well beyond what we can build today. There's a lot of hard challenges to solve. This is something that's ideal to solve in a context close between industry and academia. There are things that we can do in academia. There are things we can do in industry. There are many more things we can do when we bring this together. So that's really what we try to do in the lab. Uh, some of the challenges we look at is um, bring together all of these devices, as you'll see in the talk. They all build maps of their environments. But how can we bring this local spatial understanding of a single device to bring all of that together in um, essentially, eventually, the ambition is to map the whole world and be able to have spatial understanding at the, at the level of the whole world. So that's one big challenge, not only for devices on people, but actually also for um, robotic devices, drones, other devices, cars, have all of those live in the same maps, have a joint common understanding and be able to coordinate and work together seamlessly. Uh, so we're also looking at bringing robotics in that space. Um, and then beyond that, also having devices um, that not only track hands very precisely, know exactly the fingers and allow physical interaction between, um, between um, your real hands and the virtual holograms, but actually go beyond that to really a full understanding of what the user is doing so that you can assist the user better um, in the task, in the complicated task that the user uh, might be trying to achieve. Um, so looking in also those directions of having human understanding uh, at the level of activities uh, and so on. So those are some of the topics we cover here in the lab. Um, but enough of that. Um, so today, I'm super happy to be able to introduce uh, uh, to you Alex Kipman. Uh, Alex Kipman is a technical fellow at uh, Microsoft. Uh, he's been there for many years. Uh, one of the first big projects that many of you uh, uh, probably have heard about is uh, uh, Kinect. Uh, we actually today are in the third generation of uh, Kinect device, Azure Kinect. Uh, which is an amazing sensor. You'll probably see a little bit of this in the talk. Um, but so starting uh, of enabling the connection between uh, playing a game, having the user in the real world move in the real world, and, um, and at the same time be Im immersed in a mixed reality experience with, with the game. Um, but then beyond that, of course, build, invented HoloLens, built HoloLens, assembled a team of fantastic talent to make that happen. Um, and I was very happy to be able to join for the second iteration of that for HoloLens 2 um, and look forward to do a lot more things. And so uh, with that, uh, I'll pass the word to Alex. Good morning, everyone. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to have the opportunity to spend the hour with you here at ETH telling you a bit more about the journey we've been through with HoloLens. Um, now, my job today, you know, I could talk about HoloLens for literally a day, so my, and we only have an hour. So my job today is essentially to have us go for breadth. Your job, if you take me up on it, is to make me go for depth. So please ask me questions. Um, you're welcome to try to ask me questions throughout the presentation. 
Um, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end as well for people to ask questions, but feel free to make this participatory. It makes it much more fun um, when you actually interact than just me sitting here by myself um, chatting the whole hour. So with that, to get us in the right mood for unpacking HoloLens, let me play a video that actually walks you a little bit through what we actually created with it. So that's the forward loop from the moment of inception, from creating our custom silicon to the customer experience that we targeted with HoloLens. In the next hour, let's go backwards and rewind that video and unpack step at a time what's actually inside and what it actually took to build this uh, product. First, purpose. Uh, it was Nietzsche that once said that he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how, search for purpose, meaning. First, I want to tell you, we didn't just build the technology. We are customer obsessed at Microsoft, and we spend time with customers to understand what is it that we need to do to really create what is today the high watermark for an AI device in the edge of computing and a mixed reality device that goes on people's heads. And it's really these three features. First and foremost, in all of these products, inclusive of HoloLens, a lot of the journey is how do we increase immersion of the device? How do we make it so that you can have more of that holographic experience in front of you so that you can feel more attached as you interact with this holographic landscape. Second, we're putting a device on humans' heads. And if you think about the variety um, of shapes and sizes and any number of things that go once you put devices on a human head, you know, comfort is a huge part of what we actually need to do in order to, to uh, have this device be comfortable all day. And then finally, a lot of our work is around creating time to value. Right? At the end of the day, with the first version of HoloLens, there was a reason we called it a developer kit. It actually took developers to be involved in the loop of development before you got any value out of it. You get a HoloLens, and if you're a developer, you'd have fun. If you weren't a developer, you'd need to buddy up with a bunch of developer friends for at least a few months before you discovered value on the product. The purpose with HoloLens 2 is that out of the box, across any number of industries, we wanted to have um, value for the experience that people are creating. So for today, let's get started by talking about this idea that we more than doubled the field of view of the product. HoloLens was, HoloLens 1, was the highest watermark of what it meant to have a mixed reality device. It defined the highest field of view of what you could actually see when you put one of these devices on. Once again, with HoloLens 2, we took that and we more than doubled it. We more than doubled it in every single component that matters. For me, the component that matters most is this idea of how many pixels per degree of sight you get when you actually see a hologram. This is the difference that you know, allows you from reading text of holographic content for seeing the fine detail as you're trying to operate on a hologram. The number for HoloLens is actually 47 pixels per degree of sight. Um, that's how many photons we're able to fit in a volume to see precision of what's inside that hologram. As you double in every dimension um, the level of immersion and the field of view of the product, as you can imagine, this number runs away from you. 
right? So at the end of the day, if you to put it in simplistic terms, imagine that to achieve more than double the field of view while maintaining 47 pixels per degree of sight, you know, is the equivalent of having 2K displays for each of your eyes. Now think about your 2K or 4K televisions. Think about having two of them, but they're little sugar cubes that have to sit above your high eyes. Those are types of components that simply don't exist in the world. You can't go out somewhere and say, hey, can I have some 2K displays that are like sugar cubes that you know, pull almost no wattage um, to be able to ultimately display these holograms. So like we do at Microsoft when we know we can't find things um, out of the shelf, we've invented it. And one of the key pieces of innovation that I want to tell you about um, today and kind of break behind and tell you more about is these display engines. At the end of the day, the thing that we have with HoloLens 2 um, is this. Imagine putting these things on your head. This is where we started. That's actually a model for HoloLens 1. The one sitting on the other side is a model for HoloLens 2. You see in both cases that idea of comfort is really not there. That's about 20 pounds. This one, you know, we made some improvements. It's about 18 pounds. Right? Uh, now we say, hey, this is the magic. Right? Because if you want to create something big, ginormous, you know, that one pulls at about almost 50 watts. Um, that one is not, not, not doing much better. Uh, now, if you look at something that needs to be battery run, operated, fit in your head comfortably for most of the day, well, you need to take that and you need to shrink it. A lot of this innovation goes into the display and the custom silicon that go inside of HoloLens. So let me break apart the display engines, this thing that we invented with HoloLens 2. The technology behind it is called MEMS, right? Um, and these are laser displays. We moved away from HoloLens 1, where we had LEDs. It was an LCOS-based system, um, to a laser-based system. It gives you tons of benefits because lasers are like coherent light, right? Um, it's very digital for a format. It's either on or it's off. It's not a nice bell curve, which is what you get with you know, LEDs and things like that. So then the idea is we have three lasers. Imagine it's one of these for each of your eyes. So there's two of these in a HoloLens. Um, so three lasers, one red, one green, one blue, right? With red, green, and blue, we can create essentially any color um, on the palette. Well, we shoot lasers out, um, red, green, and blue. One, one photon, just a second, and I'll go to you. Uh, and then we hit essentially two mirrors. First, we hit a fast scanning mirror. Right? By fast scanning, I mean it goes at about 12,000 hertz, or 12,000 times per second. The purpose of that mirror is to take those lasers, just one photon, right, and spread them across the horizontal part of the display. And then those lasers hits another mirror. We call it the slow scanning mirror. It only goes at about 120 times per second, which will then squirt those same photons in the vertical, right? thus creating a virtual display Right? If you think about an LCOS system, you actually have light between e behind each of the pixels across the entire array, um, which defines the actual resolution of that display. In this case, we just have single lasers, and we build in real time right, um, what that display looks like. As a matter of fact, we're going to build that on the back of your eyes, which is how you ultimately um, see a hologram. Go ahead, sir. Um, no, we don't. So the question, I'm going to repeat it because I'm not sure you know, people online can actually hear a question. The question was, do you have problems with laser speckles? Obviously, very good question. All lasers speckle. Um, I'm not going into all the detail of all those pretty little mirrors, um, but there's one there that actually despeckles the lasers. Um, and I actually played with it because at first I'm like, maybe you don't want to despeckle the laser because wouldn't it be cool if, like, as you look at a hologram, it has sparkles. Maybe holograms are made out of diamonds. Uh, but it didn't actually look very good. And so there's pieces inside this infrastructure to actually despeckle the lasers before they do what's called coupling optics, um, which is when they couple in with our uh, SRGs, which are the lenses, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that this thing goes into. So that's a little bit about the magic of the display engines. MEMS-based technology, three lasers, red, green, and blue. One hits a fast scanning mirror at 12,000 times per second, and then hits it another one at 120 times per second. Now, to put it in perspective, you know, here's the actual photo. The previous one was just a rendition. This is the actual thing. Now, this is under a microscope, right? If you actually were to see this, this mirror, they're teeny tiny. This is actually our functioning you know, fast scanning mirror. Clearly, if you try to take a picture under a microscope at 12,000 times per second, you don't get to see a modulate like this. Um, so this is taken with a special camera under a microphone and super slowed down for you to have an idea. 
Um, you know, basic principles here, imagine I'm applying electricity, you know, alternating electricity to both sides to essentially stimulate this mirror to get to uh, um, the right frequency when you actually boot up every HoloLens. Now think about the precision of that as the device is moving up and down, as you're dropping it on the floor, as you're doing any number of other things, where if you get this, you know, more than a little bit off, um, and by little bit off, you know, think like, you know, picometers, um, the whole thing doesn't work and there's no holograms for you, right? So think about the precision that you need to have in both manufacturing and in-field calibration to make sure that the device um, actually does what it's supposed to. MEMS mirrors as a technology have existed for a while. There's no new big invention on that topic. To be able to ship it in a product at this scale, at this size, at this resonant frequency is something that has not existed on Earth uh, before. So that's a little bit about the displays. Now, these displays couple in to our optics, also known as the lenses that show up in HoloLens. Now, the HoloLens is, you know, there's many different ways in which you can build lenses um, that you're going to show content in. The first thing that people think about is like, hey, you know, why is this so hard? Just, you know, pick some LCD monitor, make it see-through, and like put it in front of people's eyes. Turns out you can't focus. Good idea, but you know, your human eye has issues with that. You can't actually focus on something that is near eye. Your eye cannot do that, right? So at the end of the day, that doesn't work. You have to project the light on the back of your eye in the same way that you perceive and understand the real world, which means that ultimately you need to guide the light or you need to guide the photons such that the photons enter this way into the back of your eye, which is why the family of technology in optics is called waveguides, right? You're taking wave photons and you're guiding them with precision in some direction, in our case, to the back of your eyes. Now, the branch of waveguides that we use in HoloLens is this thing called SRGs, also known as surface relief gratings. Essentially, you think about it as you take a piece of glass, right? You sandwich with another piece of glass, and inside that glass, you have a bunch of gratings, right? And then you shine light through it like you would on a prism, like you would when you shine it through light, Right? Light will bend. And then you play with that same concept of high school physics of TIR, or total internal reflection. Right? The light will bounce between those two mirrors a couple of times, and then eventually you'll get to the right angle, at which point you'll hit total internal reflection and escape out of the other side. Now, a few times inside a HoloLens uh, lens is a couple of million times. Right? So think about ray tracing that red, that green and blue laser, that laser that led left, hit the 12 times per second mirror, hit the 120 times time per second mirror, enter precisely through that optics, bounce millions of times inside the surface relief grating, and then hit total internal reflection precisely as it's on your exit pupil, and back to your eyes, and we form a hologram. Right? Now you say, huh. How hard could it be to have some surface gratings and bounce photons a couple of million times precisely to get it in the back of someone's eyes? I gave you guys some stats here, just so you can kind of have an idea. So I took inspiration from biology at the bottom so that you can get about size, because at least for me, I had trouble thinking, what, what do these sizes actually really mean, right? So if you look at the actual lens, right, we have two of those, one for your left eye, one for your right eye. It's about the size of a butterfly. Um, as you start coming on what's inside the, the lens, that um, droplet of water is the pro what we call coupling optics. That's the little hole at the top of the lens that I have to shine the photons that are coming from the fast scanning mirrors and the slow scanning mirrors, right? So I got to get that right to within a droplet of water. So far, so good. Um, so then you start looking at what is the glass thickness um, that we need to get um, for these lenses. And you start saying, okay, you're getting a little bit uh, more, more fine grain. It's the, the grain of a pollen. And then if you were to start looking, and I'll clock us a little bit this way, the actual gratings, the things we have to grow inside, and it's, we actually literally grow them. Um, if you're familiar with lithography as a manufacturing process, this is the closest I can relate it to. Um, building these lenses is like a lithography process. You will essentially grow these surfaces inside the glass into what we call um, a master, and then you'll stamp the lenses out. Um, and I'm skipping maybe 50 or 60 steps in between, but they just kind of stamp out um, the other end. 
in the world's most simplistic way, it's like you know burning a DVD. Um, similar process to how you would do that, but slightly more precise in what the etchings are that we have to do inside of it. To put it in perspective, you know, the gratings inside of it are that things that are about 100 nanometers. What's 100 nanometers? Put it in perspective, you cannot fit a virus between one of them. Right? If you look at, you know, your viruses are pulling in somewhere between 200 and 300 nanometers, the distance between our gratings um, are about 100 nanometers in size. Now you think, you know, because this picture makes it look simple, um, this picture essentially is the HoloLens 1 edition. All of them are slanted the same way, all of them are equally distant um, in any number of things. And if you actually, you know, are into optics and into physics, that kind of grading structure kind of runs out of laws of physics. And, you know, laws of physics, they're laws, they're not suggestions, um, past the field of view that we created for HoloLens 1. So we had to invent new science um, and push forward what we actually do in physics um, to do the second one. If I were to show you a picture of the gratings for HoloLens 2, you'd see that our gratings inside now vary in depth, in size, and in slant. Right? So now think about growing that structure. It's not all the same grading structures throughout, um, but we vary all of them so that we can shine the photons through that total internal reflection a couple of more million times um, to get the proper field of view that you go in through it. Now, if you think about the tolerances, because that's just the spacing between them, if you think how precise do you have to be, right? What is the manufacturing tolerance as you build hundreds of thousands to millions of these things? Um, that you need to get, where if you get it wrong, it's a HoloLens not working. It's a return product. It's a dead on arrival product in this case because a hologram never shows up. And it's this number called the picometer. I got about picometer worth of precision in manufacturing this growth before the whole thing falls apart. So let's put that one in perspective, right? Um, that's like you sitting about a kilometer away from a coin, and you can't get more than two arc seconds of error in the growth, right? Just think about it. Um, you need to be about a kilometer away from a quarter, and you need to be that precise, right, across millions and millions of these lenses. Um, by the way, if you think about it, you know, why do I say millions and millions? Each HoloLens has six of them, right? To your left or eye, we have one lens for red, one lens for green, one lens for blue. On the right side, we have one lens for red, one lens for green, one lens for blue. Um, those things then stack together with precision. You couple in optics to all six of them, all of these things align, and we actually form the images on the back of your eyes. Right? So that's how you take that monster thing, 18 pounds, and you make it so that you can have a precise device over your head. So that's one piece of, of, of work that we are super proud of in terms of what it takes to create an immersive, a 2x immersive device. But in essentially seeing the hologram is only half of the story and half of the fun. What fun is seeing a hologram if you can actually touch it, if you can actually feel it, if you can actually interact with it? How fun is to have a holographic product if you don't have any understanding of the environment and you don't know what the environment is doing, you don't have the context for where to actually place and pin that content over the real world? You'd be quite boring. So in this world, another piece that's huge for us in immersion, and Mark talked about it, is the depth camera, um, state-of-the-art depth camera that we ship in HoloLens. The easiest way to think about it, this is the fourth generation Kinect, right? If you think we ship Kinect 1 on Xbox 360, we ship uh, Kinect 2 on Xbox One, we ship Kinect 3 inside of HoloLens 1, welcome to the fourth generation of Kinect sensor, which ships not only in HoloLens 2, but also is the baseline for what we've made available to each of you in Azure Connect as a developer kit earlier this year. So let's talk about what we actually do in this camera. First of all, in terms of, again, branch of technology, um, this is based on TOF, or time off flight technology. Back to photons. Essentially, we shoot a bunch of photons to the real world, and then we measure photons as they come back. If I'm shooting photons to Mark, they come back faster than if I'm shooting photons to the back of the room. It takes longer. Now, mind you, all of this stuff is traveling at the speed of light. And you know, as much as I'd like to tell you that I shudder at the speed of light, we don't. So there's a little bit more magic for how you count photons. But the, the conceptual way to think about time of flight technology is you're counting photons. More photons, something is more nearby. Less photons, something is further away. This is state-of-the-art technology that um, we've been iterating on Microsoft for about 12 years. 
So it looks like this once you actually take it out. And you know, the reason I took this out is to point out that you know, we have a global shutter sensor there. That's the thing that measures the photons. But then we have two little doohickeys over there. They're lasers again, right? Those are the photons that are going out that we're going to be measuring. Why are there two and why are there different you know, looking things to them? It's because one of them is pointing down, right? We call it our short throw sensor. This is the thing that illuminates your hands and lets you do precise hand tracking. High frame rate, high precision, and all the light position to where I can see your hands. The other one points forward. Um, slower frame rate sensor. It's our long throw sensor. And it essentially allows you to do things like spatial mapping or spatial understanding. And it's really focused at understanding the environment around us. Here's uh, what it actually looks in context. This is a tool, again, in, uh, that we uh, don't make available externally. I'm sharing with you guys um, in this lecture. But this is the tool we use internally to develop it. And you see essentially here what the pipeline is that we use to create. This is an um, AI system that uses state-of-the-art technology where, you know, step one, think about it as a performance optimization. We'll region find to essentially only operate on the minimal amount of pixels as possible. Right? A lot of people you know, think about, hey, what happens when you know, your phone is on to give you all day battery life? Turns out your phone is off most of that day. And you know, most of these SOCs or systems on the chip, GPUs, CPUs, are focused on essentially being bursty. They're either on or they're off. You go play a game, GPU bursts. You do all the calculations, then GPU dies. Right? And all battery operations in modern computing are made to take advantage of this burst theory for how you do computing until HoloLens and devices like it. Our off state is all sensors on. It's all sensors on running at full frame rate because as soon as you raise your hand, something has to work, right? That whole, hey, I need to wake up now and make the thing work. I'm coming back from sleep. Well, all the sensors have to be on for you to be able to know, oh shit, I have to come back from sleep, right? Um, which breaks fundamentally most of modern computing and how you think about these problems. So hand tracking you know, has to work for, it, for this scenario. So we're running the thing at super low frame rate so that by the time you're coming in, we're like maybe, remember this is AI, right? It's probabilistic, it's not yes or no, it's maybe, it's not true or false, it's probably, right? So it's like probably, maybe I'm seeing a hand, maybe you should wanna start waking up, start increasing the frame rate, start looking at higher resolution until I get confidence that you actually are looking at a hand. Then we'll ship those pixels over to uh, you know, uh, machine learning step, you see there, where we start coloring the hand to start figuring out, hey, based on all of the learning that I've done, here's what I think um, are the hand components. And ultimately, you know, um, we don't just like shipping to developers probabilities. Um, it gets harder to compute. We'll do a model fitting step um, that will actually create an articulation and put a skeleton inside the hand so that what you get as a developer is actually precise joints for each one of your fingers, several joints um, for your fingers that you can actually operate um, on. The result is this. Now, this is way more than hand tracking. This is about you know, AI that fuses all of the senses so that this can operate much like we do as humans. This is about taking eye tracking with head tracking, with hand tracking, with environment understanding, so that for the first time with HoloLens 2, you can actually feel what it's like to touch a hologram. This shifts us from a world where you have you know, intuitive gestures, intuition, meaning you have to learn, to instinctive gestures. You're born knowing how to do it. This is a physics-based system where it's like, how would you grab a HoloLens? Do you need to teach you that you need to grab it this way? I grab it this way. You're welcome to grab it this way. Right? It's just a surface. Um, and whichever way you grab it, it just works. Right? And this idea of being able to touch a hologram increases the level of immersion and the level of instinctiveness of what it feels like to actually operate in a holographic landscape like you haven't seen or experienced before. Besides hand tracking, which we're very proud of, again, the time of flight sensors also focus on long throw ranging and long term sensing of the environment. What I have here is state of the art Kinect version 3 that ships in HoloLens 1. Nobody in the world has anything like that thing to the right, but to us it was insufficiently good. What I have here is how we've taken that state of the art and made it better with what we ship inside of HoloLens 2. That's a depth map for those that are unfamiliar with it. And if you know depth maps, man, they're wonderful little things, but my god, they're also a pain. 
right? And they're usually a pain because like, you expect to operate like it is in the real world, but there's all sorts of consequences. How reflective are the items? Um, how absorbent of IR are the items? You know, what's the, you know, the, any number of things that it will generate holes in them, will make sure that edges aren't actually sharp, or any number of things, right? Um, so as we move into HoloLens 2, you see how much that's improved. You see that hole on the bottom, something that you know, bugs a lot if you're trying to write uh, experiences on top of that map. And you see that now we're applying, you know, physics is physics. If something's 100% absorbent or 100% reflective of IR, there's no magic. Try to find photons on a mirror or on a leather couch, and there's no magic. That thing is not returning, or it's returning with aliasing um, to you. So those things generate holes. They generate pieces of that depth map that we don't understand. And now we're using AI as a post-processing step um, to actually be able to achieve you know, a much better, much more contiguous um, surface, which solves a lot of the traditional problems that you've experienced um, with time-of-flight sensors. For people in robotics land, I look forward to hearing your feedback as you try to put these puppies on robots and make them walk around. Um, in a lot of places where they probably hit their heads or miss a turn, um, I hope with this technology that will no longer be the case. The result, once you do that, is that computationally, with HoloLens 2, you get something that looks like this. Right, so this is our spatial mapping of the world. It's like dropping a blanket over the real world. And to be honest, I still hate it. And I still hate it because it's exactly what you see. It's like a blanket over the real world. What the hell does this mean? What you really want is to move to a higher level construct that moves from spatial mapping to spatial or semantic understanding of spaces. You want to understand that this is not just a blanket, but it's a chair with a human sitting on top of it. God forbid he knows Professor Polyface, that's even better. There's human recognition associated with it. And you want to start telling the difference between what's a wall, what's a mirror, what's a window, right? So that you can start figuring out what are the experiences that you're putting behind it. Last feature for immersion before we start talking about comfort is this idea of eye tracking. So HoloLens 1 had head tracking. We're able to tell where your head was. And that was awesome. Um, but if you think about it, all of that magic about photons that I talked about was not really a closed loop to the human, right? Um, all of my sensor calibration, my picometer precision, it was really sensors to display because as soon as it got to the display, I have no more data. Why? Because I didn't know where your eyes were. I was guessing where your eyes were. Matter of fact, think about moving the device in your head. It's moving in relation to your eyes. And now I'm forcing your poor little brain to make all of the calculation deltas as this thing does this. You still need to see a hologram that's straight, right? And now you move the device this way, which means they're not entering your eyes correctly, which means now your brain is doing the calculations to adjust the world for you, which you know, are things that cause discomfort over time. Well, with HoloLens 2, we don't have that anymore. I know precisely where your eyes are, and you can move the device as much as you want. Not only do we know your interpupillary distance, or IPD, automatically, we can keep track in field precisely of how the device is moving on your head, and we can in real time adjust for your eyes the quality of the holograms, thus removing stress from your brain and making the device more comfortable. That's the number one reason why we added eye tracking, is to add a ton of comfort to the device. Now, as soon as you do that, you get some things for free. You might as well take advantage of having a precise eye tracking system. And you can do that for things that you know, um, will feel to you like I'm reading your brain. Right? The first time you're on a HoloLens 2 and you're reading text and you don't have to scroll anymore, it, it's magic. Right? And you never have to scroll sideways or up and down, and things just auto-scroll for you. Um, this is the only I've been working on you know, AI workloads in the analog domain for a good 12 years. And like, one of the key things that kills all of us is latency. You're always trying to erase latency from all of those things because you're trying to create real-time systems. In eye tracking, is the only workload I've ever worked on where I had to insert latency. Right? There's this very famous psychology test where you look at an analog clock. And you guys can all do it when you get home today. Uh, and you know, pay attention to how long the first second takes for you. And every single human will tell you, because that's how humans work, um, that the first second, weirdly enough, seemed to take longer than the other seconds. That's because your, your brain is buffering the image from your eyes, right? And as you move quickly from side to side, you have about a second worth of latency before you can actually graft to what's going on, and your brain hallucinates reality um, during that buffering time. Turns out that if I'm looking at your eyes, I get that information before your brain processes it. When we started doing eye tracking, we'd get it wrong in the lab with customers all the time. I'm like, damn it, how can we not get eye tracking right? It's because while you said you were looking at this thing, and I said you were looking at this thing, 
you thought you were looking at this thing, but your eye was already here. All right, so now this is a place where we tuned it now, and it's quite magical because as soon as I'm ahead of your brain, I'm not ahead of your eye, I'm ahead of your brain, it seems like I'm reading your brain. All right, you're like, how did you know I wanted to scroll? I didn't know myself I wanted to scroll. <laughs> well, your eye already knew you wanted to scroll, and you had moved forward. Go ahead, sir. I wish, um, you know, humans didn't vary. Like, there's not a single question in humanity that doesn't vary by humans. Um, all of us little machines, man, are we different. Uh, and this goes a lot. Like, when you get a HoloLens, the first step you will do, you'll see that, you know, um, hummingbird come in, and the hummingbird will play with you. And in the process of doing that, we will calibrate and machine learn for your eyes. Um, and each time someone puts a HoloLens on, if you actually see it, and you can disable it if you want, but I don't encourage it, um, you'll say, this is the first time I've seen your eyeballs. Would you like to run to calibration? You don't have to, but then I'm going to run the previous person's machine learning thing, um, which gets you most of the way there, but it's not going to get you all the way there. Now, as soon as you get eye tracking working, the thing you get for free also is iris recognition. Now, this is the single most precise biometric framework in existence. To put it in perspective, our iris recognition gets you about one in a million false accepts at about 98% true positives. That's better than like your strongest password you could dream about coupled with your fingerprint and then some. Right? Most of those things pull about 1 in 100,000 false accepts at about 95% true positives. This is what it actually looks like. Right? Um, at the end of the day, and again, I've slowed this video quite significantly. This is a high frame rate camera for eye tracking. It's a monochrome camera. And what you see for those that spend time in the space is that the, the uh, methodology we use for eye tracking is actually glint differencing. We'll illuminate your eye with IR, those are the little dots, right? And then essentially we'll take that to make what a 2D picture is, which is what you're seeing here, and we'll extract from, those, from that glint a 3D model from your eye, and based on that 3D model, I can get a gaze vector. Um, and from that, the rest is kind of history. Finally, we talk a lot about holograms and touching holograms, but one of the key things that's so critical for us is actually how we deal with your speech and how we deal with the audio and the acoustic landscape around you. Um, I'm super proud of what we did for both, you know, uh, um, spatial audio and speech recognition with HoloLens 1. But being customer obsessed, we gave this to all of our folks, and they're like, hey, I'm using HoloLens 1 in a manufacturing facility. I'm like, so? They're like, it's super loud. And we had to go and measure what does loud feel like. We heard back from other people. They're like, I'm fixing a jet propulsion engine. Um, like, it doesn't work for speech. I'm like, dude, you're wearing, like, big headphones because it's so loud and you want me to be able to listen to things? they like, yeah. So we said, oh, okay, how the hell do you design that? Um, and here's a design that we've created for HoloLens 2. The first thing you see that I've highlighted at the top is there's three little beautiful little holes. Those are ambient microphones. They're microphones that are there to really image, from an acoustic perspective, the audio landscape around you um, so that we can subtract it. And then what we've done is we've moved to the bottom of HoloLens. You can't see it. It's amazing. The amount of you know, suffering and pain I put the team through to get this, because the lazy engineer was just like, OK, we have microphones on the bottom. They're right here. You would have been able to see the connector, because like, these two microphones need to connect to the SOC and the HPU and all the stuff that's here. You won't see it. Um, so when you get one of these, you know, spend time figuring out how the hell did they get microphones here at the bottom without me being able to see anything um, on the way there with a lot of sweat um, and a lot of pain. At the end of the day, why do we put them in there? Previous ones, they were here, right? The HoloLens 1 design had the microphones actually sit on the surface, not on glass on the bottom. Well, kind of hard for me to listen to you in those loud environments. So now what we've done is we put them right here so that I can create a bubble right in front of your mouth, a precise bubble, which I can then beam form to, to do precise speech recognition. Results, ladies and gentlemen, the drum rolls, please, um, is you put them in these labs, right? This is some of the labs. I just took a, a little bit so you can get a feel for what you know, being in, in Redmond feels like. The guy at the top um, is our anechoic chamber. Anechoic chambers are essentially floating rooms. Um, that you can go in that are, you know, capable of removing or not being susceptible to the vibrations of Earth. In Redmond, we have the single Guinness World Book of Record, quietest anechoic chamber in the world. If you ever want to meditate, I go there every now and again. You go in, you close the door, my God, easy place to uh, 
clear your thoughts. As a matter of fact, if you close the lights, um, you should be sitting down because you'll probably fall. You'll lose perspective of balance. It's so quiet. It's like floating in space. Um, but, you know, that's not the cool part. Before long, you'll start hearing your heartbeat. Um, and you start doing all sorts of things. That's how quiet it is. That's where we test this thing, and that's where we calibrate it. Um, this is one of our friends. We have many of these, um, and we put lots of HoloLenses on them. The thing that you see here, um, and this one I don't have a HoloLens on him, but usually there's a HoloLens on him, and we'll then play a bunch of sound, and we'll torture the dummy, right, with the HoloLens on so that we can make sure in all sorts of different environments um, how this thing actually works. One of my favorite ones is this poor sucker has to listen to 80 hours worth of um, podcasts so that we can see that all the podcasts that are coming in won't get our speech recognition to hallucinate keyword spotting and things of that nature, resulting in something like this. Here is that guy manufacturing. To put it in perspective, that's an environment that's about 90 dBs worth of ambient noise. I do this because people are like, I, I can't conceptualize 90 dBs. We do this where like when I'm being pre over, I'll actually start turning the sound on and I go like with white noise until we get to 90 dBs. People usually ask me to stop far before I get to that point. They're like, my ears are hurting, I need earpieces. That's how loud 90 dBs worth of ambient noise actually is. In our world, you can be that with your little head earpieces on. You can speak with normal voice to HoloLens and everything will work. I'll move us through quickly, spatial audio was innovative in HoloLens 1. There's not a ton of new innovation on it, but it's the single most precise spatial sound that's putting sound in 3D space. Again, you know, that's not about us. It's about you, the human. It's not about the HoloLens. For me to be able to spatially play sound, that means that I need to understand how you, the human, works. Right back to everybody's different. Mm. In humans, you need to infer from it this thing called HRTFs, or human transform functions. Right, think about all your little pieces of your ear and the little lobes, and this is essentially created as you're a kid to get you as a human to be able to perceive audio in 3D. As a matter of fact, if I were to take you all guys and girls as babies, you don't know spatial sound, right? In the same way that you don't know depth of field. Those things are etched in firmware as you grow up. You're not born with them, right? What lets you see depth at the end of the day is your interpupillary distance and a bunch of other things that we're all different from, so you're born not knowing it, and over the first couple of years of your life, you'll etch that in firmware and then never change it again. Equally, it's the way your ears form and your lobes and everything that lets you perceive audio from a spatial perspective. And again, that's something that you etch in firmware um, after you're born. We need to infer that human transfer function for every human in a HoloLens for you to be able to perceive audio in 3D. All of that goes through our HPU, or holographic processing unit. This is custom silicon, first of its kind and best of its kind um, now, that runs AI inferencing on the edge. I won't spend a ton of time on it, but we run all of our sensor data through it and all of our AI to it. Back to if I was trying to run all of this state-of-the-art AI in an SOC on a GPU and a CPU, you need a car battery to go run it and you wouldn't be at frame rate, right? So we do all of that on the HPU. The HPU does all the reasoning, goes to the SOC, which then hits back the HPU before it hits the photon engines, the display engines, to put the photons on the back of your eyes. So let's talk about comfort. So that was just how we got two times the immersion. Comfort was harder. In comfort, we were like, okay, we got a three exit. People say, Alex, you made that shit up. No, 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 it's quite well documented in our lab. It's actually an objective measure um, for comfort. So it's actually per human, which is why I don't quote time. Right? Field of view, I can give you the number um, because it's computed. Here, it's per human. Whatever your number was, multiply by three, right? If it was 10 minutes comfortable for you, it's 30 minutes. If it was three hours, it's nine hours, right? So per human is three hours more comfortable. I just want to give you a flavor of that problem as we speed through it. Like, humans are different. There's actually, like, genetically, we're different. I'm just showing you here a little bit, you know, top view of skulls, right? And I'm showing you, like, skulls from uh, Asian skulls to, say, European skulls, and you see that not only the forehead is different, but the temples are different. Why does that matter? Man, if I'm trying to put pressure on those temples, depending on which cranium you have, you're going to get a headache if I do it wrong. Right? This is why you don't usually create glasses for those that are wearing glasses. It's not like a si one size fits all. You actually go to an eye doctor and they fit it to your head. Mind you, the glasses most of you are wearing are sub-10 grams, um, and you still take it off to do this every now and again during the day. We're not less than 10 grams. We're pulling in at 580 grams on your head, and we're trying to do that comfortably by essentially not distributing weight on cartilage, nose and ears, but by putting it on bone. 
And you say, that's easy. You put it on bones. How hard could that be? Well, I got to put that pressure somewhere. And if you put it in the wrong stop to the wrong human, you'll cause discomfort. That's one dimension, you know, diversity of just like genetics. Here's another one. This is about the smallest head size to the biggest head size in terms of width. Now, I could come up with a small, medium, large HoloLens. Think how cool that would be for sharing it in the lab. <laughs> but we create one size fits all. We need to address all of these problems comfortably from child to adult to little head to big head. Think about this one to the point of how similar are humans. The distance from your forehead to your eyes is also super varied to humans. I'm giving you an example of someone whose head scan the eyes right near the forehead, and someone who the eyes quite distant from the forehead. As a matter of fact, I don't have the number here. That's about 15 mill millimeters of distance between those two. Now, why does that matter? Well, I'm putting the device here, right? I can't really put it against your eye. I have to put it in front of your forehead. And those photons I need to put precisely inside your eyes, the distance matters. As a matter of fact, light decays at a square function. Right? And if you want to see those bright little holograms, it doesn't matter if the thing is, you know, 15 or 0 millimeters from your eyes. In HMD, or head-mounted display speak, that's called eye relief. Eye relief is how much distance do you have that you can support seeing a hologram. That couples with this other concept called eye box. What is the size of the eye box? If you want to do this in a trivial way, like most other people do, you make a super tiny eye box, and you make it work on a super small eye relief. And then if you get it at all wrong, you don't see a hologram anymore. So I usually, these people that want to demonstrate this stuff to you will chin strap you on a bench and say, can you see the hologram? Look how easy it is. <laughs> Big, huge difference. How do you account for that? That means if you're doing naively on the other way, I'll come up with an infinitely big eye box, and I'll support an infinitely big eye relief. And then the device will look like if you've seen Star Wars or Spaceballs, like the big helmet thing, um, you'll look something like that. Uh, in our world, we have a single fitting device that fits over the entire range of human head sizes. Actually, I'm lying. I, I'm NDTH. I should be precise. 95% of all human head sizes. Um, and it's made to fit comfortably over the 95th percentile, over glasses, under glasses, and any number of things in between. How do we do that? We have this fancy scanning machine and then some. We've scanned over quite a long period of time all sorts of uh, human heads to be able to essentially do what we do. Let me walk you through some of the challenges. The first one is this idea of comfort in the front. The game here is how proud is your device. Pride in this world is bad. Pride means how far away is it from your head. The further the device is, when there's lots of weight, the more pressure you put on the back of your neck. The more pressure you put on the back of your neck, the less comfortable it becomes. Now remember that picometer precision? Well, that means that the sensor configurations, there's two things that matter when you deal with sensors, intrinsics of those sensors. How does the sensor know about itself over time? And extrinsics, what's the relationship between sensors and sensors and ultimately sensors to display? Those super tight precisions means that over time, as heat makes the device expand, contract, as you drop it, as the thing moves around, you cannot move the sensors away from each other. Otherwise, calibration falls off and things fall apart. Traditionally, um, what you can do to do that uh, is create big devices um, that make the thing super heavy. With HoloLens 2, we made it out of carbon fiber. Um, we made the entire outside enclosure of HoloLens in carbon fiber to address that. Uh, that was a huge change for us in order to address comfort. Here's what it looks like when you actually drop it. Why is carbon fiber cool? It's super rigid. Carbon fiber as a material choice does not expand or contrast as you throw more or less heat into it. If you look there, that's how, how we did it in HoloLens 1. We needed to have a magnesium, another object that doesn't change with temperature as you heat it and as you contrast it. We call it our magnesium sensor bar. I mounted all the sensors inside of magnesium, and we put the magnesium thing inside of plastic. Plastic is super wobbly. Um, you, you heat it, it expands. You, you cold it, it shrinks. It doesn't matter. Magnesium doesn't. What's the problem? It's adding a ton of area inside the product, um, and it's adding a ton of weight in the product where you're not supposed to, in the pride area, more forward weight. Well, with HoloLens 2, we mount all the sensors, not on a magnesium sensor bar, but rather directly on the carbon fiber. It's a huge endeavor because, you know, carbon fiber is fabric. 
I mean, if you think about, you know, people say, what's the hardest thing in HoloLens 2? I say everything, but my God, this carbon fiber thing um, was one of the material choices we made as a team that's completely right for the customer, but from an engineering perspective, shipping that correctly um, has been a huge, huge endeavor. Here's the other thing that we care about uh, when we talk about comfort, thermals, right? Remember how much wattage am I running through this thing? Watts equals thermals equals heat. Unlike other devices, this heat goes against your skin. It doesn't go against any skin, it goes against a very sensitive skin, also known as your face. Right? So we're like, hey, how you heat and how you cool this device matters. In, you know, naively, I could put lots of fans inside of it, um, but we don't. It's a passively cool device because we're cool people, so we passively cool the device. Um, that means that we play to thermodynamics to do it. Hot air rises, cold air drops. Right? We use these things called chimneys or channels, those holes you see on it, to really make sure that thermodynamics of this product happen as they're supposed to. Um, at some point, tell me to tell you the story of putting this on the International Space Station where microgravity throws a, uh, a curveball at the whole thermodynamics game. But the point here is even distribution of heat. When you look at one of these things, you don't want to see spots of red. Spots of red is temperature and skin that's going to be uncomfortable over time. Right? So um, if you try to build it and then measure it, you're screwed. You'll never do it. You'll build a HoloLens in about 150 years. <laughs> Um, so we simulate everything, and the reason I show you this picture is to show you how close is our simulation from reality, because anybody can simulate. The question you should really ask yourself is a second-order derivative. Does your actual simulation represent reality? Right? So you see here, there's our simulation before we ever built a HoloLens 2, what we thought it was going to do. Here's the actual measurement of one under the lab. As a matter of fact, here's the whole thing heating up. We turned it on. And you see the perfect distribution of heat. Obviously, with the points of heat, the microphones um, are heating out and the channels are heating out. Now, for the perceptive here in the audience, you're like, my god, what kind of magic did you work on the back? The back, I'm going to play this again in case you missed it, because it's a lot of fun. Look how fast it perfectly distributes the heat in the back. And hello, there's no channels. And yes, it's still passively cooled, and it's still there's no fans on it. At first. We added channels to it. Two channels in the front, two channels in the back. The device looked horrible. I couldn't do it. I'm like, it's much bigger. It's thicker in the back. It's uncomfortable when I put my head everywhere. We got to get rid of the channels. And the team said, oh, we can add a fan. I'm like, fans are dead to me. We're cool. We're passively cool device, thermodynamics. They're like, Alex, like, we need some way to like, heat this device um, to like, get the, the air out. We got to put some holes in it. I'm like, no holes. Make it skinnier. Here's what the team came up with, um, which is innovation with HoloLens 2. We essentially created a vapor chamber. Um, so this is a titanium vapor chamber. There's really water in there. Um, and the idea is, is that vapor chamber will get all of the heat surfaces. It's water, right? And you'll actually turn into vapor, and you'll immediately dissipate all of the heat in the right direction so that you don't have, like traditionally, if I was going to put this without a, a heat chamber, you just see two holes um, in the back, one for the GPU, one for the CPU, and a third one a little lighter for the batteries. You didn't see that. You saw a perfect distribution of heat, which allowed us to get to the right you know, um, TDP or, or, or temperature um, to be able to passively cool the device. Here's how that works in practice. It starts. You see that the SOC or the SOC is heating up. And before long, you see that perfect temperature distributed across all of it. That's water making sure that that point of heat where the SOC sits behind this vapor chamber actually does its thing. And then what is the actual result? The result of all of this engineering, at the end of the day, there's only one metric that counts, which is how do you do all of the above, from the carbon fiber to the vapor chamber to the channels to all of the design to distribute the weight of the device. When people put a HoloLens on, they say, 3X, we thought you were nice uh, selling ice to Eskimos. Um, you were really actually more than that. The device feels so good. What have you done? You must have like, shaved most of the weight. And I'm like, turns out HoloLens 1 was 582 grams. HoloLens 2 is 580 grams. And they're like, no. This thing is so much more comfortable. And I'm like, it's because you're asking the wrong question. In the same way that immersion is not about field of view, comfort is not about weight. Um, comfort is about distribution of that weight on your head. It's like designing a car. You want to get, you know, perfect balance. We measure balance because all humans are different, see eyeballs, as from your personal eyes, how far is the center of gravity of the device on your head. In HoloLens 1, that was at about 11 millimeters from wherever your eye was, which gives you the comfort of HoloLens 1. With HoloLens 2, I'll play that again, 
is about 70 millimeters. So we go from 12 millimeter center of gravity to about 70 millimeters, just right behind your ear, which allows the device to float on your head. Right? That's one of the key things. Um, and by the way, just to claim a little bit of credit, because it was a lot of work for a lot of people on the team, we did shave about 200 grams from the product. So you're like, wait a minute, 200 grams, 2 grams, where's the math error? We added all the way back in comfort features. Right? All the extra foam, all the extra padding, all the extra comfort on your head. Because it's not about weight, it's about comfort. Right? So um, in hardware, we actually shaved a ton of weight. In device, we didn't because we're trying to get the comfort. So with that, you know, let me just end really quickly with time to value. On the time to value side, for us, it was super important to work at Microsoft to bring a first um, set of inbox applications um, that do just a lot of work. But we also partnered with a huge set of ISVs across every single industry to make sure that we took processes that used to take months, and now we can accomplish them in a mere minutes. But we didn't do just that with HoloLens in terms of time to value. As much as I'm proud to talk about the device all day, HoloLens was designed from the ground up to work in this worldview that we have of an intelligent cloud with infinite intelligent edges. It was designed from the ground up to take advantage of our entire Azure cloud. As a matter of fact, with HoloLens 2, we launched our mixed reality services. The two that we launched um, earlier this year, the first one, which comes primarily from our beautiful Zurich Research Laboratory, is Azure Spatial Anchors. Azure Spatial Anchors is a very hard computer science problem which tries to solve not only placing a hologram in the world, that's SLAM, right? Simultaneous localization and mapping, but rather say, hey, I can place it there and I can persist that over arbitrary large spaces over time. So it's about persisting holograms over space and time where we're literally trying to create a digital twin of the entire world. Now, to just put it in perspective, to make it a little bit more human, how hard the science is behind it. You know, think about me walking in the bedroom of my daughter. I have a beautiful nine-year-old daughter on a weekend. It's sunny outside. The room is super organized. I love her to pieces. I play with her all weekend long. My wife walks in at nine, and she's like, what the hell? Where am I? The room is a mess and it's dark outside. My wife, who's a human and way more smart than HoloLens, um, has trouble recognizing that environment. And this is what you're asking on a world scale when you're playing Minecraft Earth, when you're in a HoloLens in a manufacturing facility, to know that that hologram is in that corner precisely, centimeter precise, over space and over time. And for all of our cloud services, we didn't do them just for HoloLens. We've done them in a cross-platform way so that they go from iOS to Android to any other SLAM-capable device. And we also did remote rendering. Another issue with these devices is that much as I love holograms, right, and as much as I love 47 pixels per degree of eyesight, the other thing that people that do this work talk about is polygons and polygon count. I'm super mega proud of how many polygons you can get on a HoloLens one. Um, it's about 100,000 polygons, which is about that engine. But most of our enterprise cases, people are like, hey, if I'm really going to get rid of the maquette on the table as an architect, if I'm really going to get rid of that CAD file uh, inside of a PC, you need to be pushing 100 million polygons. You guys are all smarter than me on calculating Moore's law and how long it's going to take a mobile GPU to go from 100,000 polys to 100 million polys. I don't think we'd be on HoloLens 2 anymore. It might be in HoloLens 45. Um, we don't have that kind of time to enable these times of customer scenarios. Thus, we've created remote rendering. Remote rendering allows us to create infinite polygon products um, and objects, but do them rather on the cloud. You say, dude, how hard could that be? Um, it's called rendering in the cloud. Well, one detail, we have to get it at zero latency. I have nine milliseconds, so not zero. I need to be precise here at ETH again. I have nine milliseconds. Um, from the first photon that goes out to the last photon that goes into your back of your head, and that input interaction needs to be that good. Otherwise, you go touch a hologram and move it, and it doesn't move. It'll move a few seconds later, maybe 120 milliseconds later. Um, now, if you try to do remote rendering, which is not new science, um, but at nine milliseconds, now it is new science. Um, and that's what remote rendering really enables you to do. And then finally, one of the things I'm most proud of, we said all of the above is open. Hashtag open, baby, and let's live in a modern way of society, um, right? If you think about, you know, the current state of technology across many places, a lot of people are, like, looking at the world as, like, I must have these vertically integrated closed ecosystems. I need to have these walled gardens. 
Well, as leaders in mixed reality, we had a choice to make. Do you want to create the next wall garden for computing? And the answer is no. We wanted to create it open. What does that mean? Basically, we said, look, this whole idea that app stores are closed, meh, baloney. Um, any developer should have the freedom to bring their own app stores. Of course, we're going to have a Microsoft store in HoloLens. We do today. But if you wanted Epic to bring a store, if you wanted uh, Valve to bring a store, if you wanted to create your next billion-dollar holographic business by creating your own app store on HoloLens or any of other devices, you'd be welcome to. We also said, hey, this whole browsing idea that if you're on a platform, you must use my browser because that's all the monetization comes in, um, you know, baloney. Of course, we have Microsoft Edge. It's Chromium-based, by the way, working on HoloLens. Um, but I don't care if you want to bring Firefox, if you want to bring Chrome, if you want to go create the next mixed reality native uh, browser that's going to, like, you know, bank and, and revolutionize how the world works, all open. Um, and then finally, the API. Oops. I guess that animated. Um, the platform. The platform is also entirely open. Now, we work and spend a lot of time with all of the open bodies, from OpenXR to Kronos to any others, stimulating and driving as leaders those standards forward. But we don't wait for them. They tend to move a little bit slower than we do. Um, but with that in mind, even though we are absolutely in those things, making all of our stuff consistent, and we're always first and we're always best in all of those standards, um, we're actually making all of the things where, where the world is not there yet also open. Think, for example, things like eye tracking. Eye tracking is not yet part of the OpenXR um, platform. It will be, and we're driving it towards that way. Um, but it's open already um, on HoloLens. What does that enable at the end of the day? Very cool experiences that I'd show you a video about. But since I'm fresh out of time, um, I want to thank each of you for the time today. And I have time for, let's call it, two questions um, before I make you all late for wherever you have to go to next. There we go, two hands up. Go for it. A hundred percent great question. So I'm not going to repeat it because you're on the microphone. People heard it, yeah? Um, at the end of the day, huge importance to us. HoloLens was designed from the ground up to take advantage of the cloud, but it has no requirement of cloud. In the same way that our cloud is cross-platform and doesn't work just for HoloLens, HoloLens works offline, underwater, in a submarine, and doesn't require any cloud connectivity or any connectivity at all, or any connectivity just to our cloud. You're welcome to connect it to other clouds as well. So that's hugely important for us. Thank you for asking that question. In terms of how many polygons you can do, it really depends on you. Um, the developer, right? Um, depending on the scene count, um, what kind of LODs you're doing on it. So it really depends on what is the scene you're trying to create. On average, if you're pretty well to do with Unreal or Unity, you can probably hit about 100,000 polys, um, polygons. Um, if you have something super duper dense um, and you're not as good, the more average you're going to get around 40, 50,000 polys. Hi, fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you. You've done so much work on refining what a head-mounted display looks like. Do you envision a world where you're kind of even past the displays? And I, I know Microsoft did something. I want to say it was called Immersa Room or Intelli Room. This idea of projecting into the world an actual real-world augmentation. There seems to be a lot of customer resistance to putting stuff on your head. What are your thoughts about what this could look like ten years from now? Um, I think it's a great question. There is no dogma and Microsoft on our team on the actual device. As a matter of fact, we don't think about the device. Obviously, we do think a lot about the device and spend a lot of time on it, but we think about the experience. At the end of the day, the goal we have is creating the future human platform, right? It's creating a world where it's really about the humans. It's about presence. It's about giving us the ability to display space and time um, in a computing form. Right? Imagine the moment where I can be anywhere um, at any time with anyone. Right? How do I remove language barriers? How do I remove space barriers? How do I remove time barriers? By the way, that's what technology is all about. Go home and watch television. That's like theater, time and space displays. Send someone an email, you're displacing time. Walk with me on Mars, you're displacing space. Everything else is a con, in a way. Right? Uh, all we're trying to do in the next era of computing with mixed reality is say, don't do that through a monitor having to speak like a machine. Try to do that instinctually over the world with holograms. And yes, today, by all means, you have to put a device on your head. I do think, I don't remember the time scale you set. For the next five years, ten years, I probably imagine you're still going to have a device on your head. Um, but ultimately, as you move forward in time, um, what we care about is the content over the real world. What we care about is the humans in the real world and all the different strategies for how you do it. 
Um, the technology you talked about, which comes from Microsoft Research, was called the Lumi Room, um, which is cool, super cool research, and that's why we have research at Microsoft, so they can do super cool things. Um, but it's a very different experience. It was projectors that's projecting on a wall, right? And although super cool in terms of extending your television, it's very flat. Um, now, what the thing is interesting is technologies that will ultimately put photons on the back of your eyes, which that did not, that just, you know, projected photons on walls. And as long as I can guide photons to the back of your eyes, thus allowing you to see holograms or people, places, and things made out of light instead of matter, life is great. My cheat, because I'm a lazy engineer, is I got to put a device on your head to get those photons guided to the back of your eyes. But it's not inconceivable to think, well, how long does it take for me to be able to, on a surface, a table, right, or on a, a wall, be able to have enough precision of photons to be able to guide them and the people in that room or that space, them inside your head. Um, I believe that technology will exist in our lifetime, and at that point, in those spaces, you're not going to need the device on your head. Um, but you're still going to want to go to a park to see that beautiful hologram or to have that teleportation. And in that space, um, when there's not walls around you in a room that's outfitted for it, you're probably going to still have a device on your head. Um, but at that point, you won't be a device. It might be something tiny, right? It might be contact lenses. It might be any number of other things that people actually achieve. I want to thank each of you for the time today. Um, sorry I went a little bit long. I get excited, and I didn't leave a ton of time um, for questions. I super appreciate each of you coming and spending time with us today. Thank you. Uh.